Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for those who stayed for my presentation. Um, the National Council of Teacher Quality looks at five areas when trying to determine what makes a good teacher, what states are doing well in order to, doing well policy-wise to cultivate a high-quality teaching workforce. And as you can see, the, the first three aren't ones that I'm going to really touch on. I'm going to touch on the last two. But I just wanted to put this here to emphasize the fact that the delivery of well-prepared teachers and expanding the pool of teachers is an absolutely critical discussion uh, that we need to have if we're going to raise the quality of the teacher workforce. I'm not going to address recruitment here, but we have to think about what kind of teachers are our universities producing? Are they producing enough teachers in the areas that we need it the most? <coughs> so one day we'll have that discussion. Unfortunately, I don't think it'll be today. Let's just get this out of the way. Teacher turnover can be both good and bad. No one wants a bad teacher to continue in the profession. We want them to leave. Go find another pursuit, perhaps painting or some other pursuit that they will find fulfilling rather than doing uh, damage in the classroom. It can also be terrible when we have a great teacher that leaves and decides to either leave the profession or go to another state or do, uh, do whatever they would like. Uh, when a bad teacher leaves, obviously the organizational culture improves. Everyone gets along a little better. When a bad teacher uh, leaves, uh, you know, we eliminate unproductive expenditures. In other words, money that we spend that actually doesn't pr produce anything uh, for student productivity, student progress, student achievement. On the other hand, uh, it imposes a cost on the school districts when we have any teacher leave, uh, estimates are around between five and $20,000 to replace the teacher that leaves. Um, so it is uh, with that in mind that I will start to start a discussion of some of the teacher turnover data or lack thereof. And this is really the problem. We're looking at what are other states doing to retain teachers? Uh, we have some sense of what other states are doing, but unfortunately we don't have a whole lot of sense of which states are really struggling with teacher turnover and which states are doing well. Now I tried really hard to find Connecticut and, and uh, New Jersey's teacher turnover rate. I couldn't find it anywhere. Terrible website. Uh, but I did find it for Illinois. And unfortunately uh, for Illinois and New York it's kind of misleading because Illinois' uh, teacher turnover rate is about 15%. But one of the things you have to keep in mind is Chicago. Uh, Chicago is going to drive a lot of that turnover, and the same applies to New York State with its 14% turnover, 23% uh, turnover for teachers with less than five years of experience, but that is skewed by New York City. So we can't really look at those states and try to determine what they are doing uh, to try to retain teachers. Now, South Carolina is an interesting example with a turnover rate of around 11%. Uh, should keep in mind that uh, their teacher workforce is about half of what ours is, uh, but there is a great deal of variation in teacher turnover in South Carolina. You have some districts that have around 5% turnover. You have some districts that have 30% turnover in South Carolina, a lot like what we have here in North Carolina. So, you, you know, on the surface, that 11% South Carolina sounds really great compared to ours, which is 14.8% but there is a great deal of variation, and there are districts in South Carolina that struggle just like some of the districts here in North Carolina struggle to retain teachers. By the way, there is one other state that does have a teacher turnover rate, and that's Texas, and of course that suffers from the Illinois problem and the New York problem in the sense that you have huge cities in Texas. You have Houston and you have Dallas, so their 16.2% turnover rate uh, is you know larger than ours, but of course they have these very urban, large districts. Uh, and by the way, for, for all those who wonder why teachers go to uh, Houston Independent School District, uh, it's because they have a 19.5% teacher turnover rate, so they need as many teachers as they can get. I don't think they put that in their advertising when they come recruiting in North Carolina. So who leaves? Well, research tells us that we have some idea of the types of teachers that leave. Oh, if you think about the teachers that leave, it's a U-shape. 
with a lot of teachers at the beginning of the career and at the end of their career leaving the profession. And that's a problem, of course, that we know very much about. The teachers are going to retire at the end, and at the beginning, they're sort of trying this whole thing out, determining whether it's for them. The problem comes when we start seeing science teachers and math teachers uh, leaving the profession because they have other options. Uh, these are teachers with skills that can translate into the nonprofit private sector. So more often than not, science and math teachers are leaving. We can also see that there are some studies that indicate that uh, English language arts teachers and special education teachers leave at higher rates because they have skills that translate into other sectors. Um, the middle row uh, is probably the, the one where uh, we need to address probably the most. The teachers in low income schools, in low performing schools, in high minority schools, and in urban schools. This is where uh, you know, a lot of the turnover is. Uh, according to one estimate, uh, this is from the federal government, uh, schools that had over 75% free and reduced lunch uh, retained about 78% of their teachers. Uh, but if you looked at schools that had under 35% free and reduced lunch, they retained up to 87% of their teachers. So it's very hard for these districts to be able to retain high quality teachers, whereas in lower poverty schools, uh, it's relatively easy. So why do teachers leave the profession? You see that I have compensation there. We'll get to the compensation in a minute, but just look at all those different reasons. Now, one of the things that's misleading about our teacher turnover report is that we report one reason why teachers leave. Uh, they left because of X, so they left because of Y. But the truth is they leave because of various other reasons as well. It's not just compensation. It's personal circumstances. They don't like their principal. They think the school district is too big. The working conditions are terrible. They don't have the books that they need, or the labor market is somehow enticing them to move on to another field. It's a very complex issue that we can't just characterize by saying, identifying one reason why a teacher is leaving. And that's why we can't say, if we just raise the compensation, teachers are gonna stay in school. Well, that doesn't address a lot of the other issues that we would have to deal with, the working conditions, the demographics of the students, and personal circumstances which really is one of the major reasons why teachers leave. Uh, according to one federal study, personal factors was number one of why teachers leave the teaching profession. Uh, unfortunately, number two is other. I hate that, uh, but other is the other reason why. And uh, the third was career factors. They, they <coughs> wanted to go to a more fulfilling career or career that better suits their needs. And compensation uh, was a distance, distant fourth on that list. Uh, in South Carolina, it's very similar. Uh, South Carolina teachers leave the profession, number one, because of a personal choice. They want to stay home. They want to do something that uh, uh, better suits their lifestyle. Number two, they took a teaching position in another South Carolina public school system, a lot like North Carolina's turnover. That happens in South Carolina as well. And number three, retirement. So it's very similar to what happens in North Carolina there in South Carolina. The only reason why I can able, uh, I'm able to cite those statistics is because South Carolina is one of the few states that tracks this stuff. Uh, North Carolina should be commended for the work that it has done in tracking teacher attrition <coughs> and mobility. Unfortunately, there are plenty of states that are way far behind in trying to get this data. Now we can approve what we have, but we should appreciate the fact that we can have discussions about why teachers leave North Carolina schools, whereas other states don't have that data available to them. So what are other states doing to retain teachers? As you can see that there are uh, six states that stand out for the National Council of Teacher Quality uh, that have policies in place that retain effective teachers. Uh, most of these have some sort of differentiated pay, and we'll get to that in a minute. But you can see North Carolina fares well with uh, teacher induction, getting teachers prepared as they come into the classroom for the first time. It's no secret that coming out of a school of education doesn't necessarily prepare you for the classroom. Having student taught doesn't prepare you for the classroom. It's an entire, entirely different ball game, and the National Council for Teacher Quality says North Carolina does a pretty good job of induction. 
professional development. Uh, North Carolina meets that goal as well. I think more can be done there, and I'll discuss that in a moment. But they are pleased with our efforts to uh, provide professional development for teachers. Now, pay scales and performance pay, we don't really stack up to their standards. They point to states like Florida that give local districts the uh, opportunity to develop their own salary schedules. Now, they can't just make up anything. Uh, they must ensure that the most effective teachers receive salary increases greater than the highest salary adjustment available. So a condition for them to uh, Florida districts to create their own salary schedule is that they have to reward teachers uh, based on uh, performance. Uh, there are seven states, Florida, Hawaii, Indiana, Louisiana, Michigan, Nevada, and Utah that directly tie teacher compensation to teacher evaluation results. Now, Louisiana is an interesting case. Uh, say you're a teacher, graduate from a teacher education program in Pennsylvania, and you want to come down to somewhere in the South. Well, here's what a Louisiana school will provide you. You get $3,000 per year for four years to teach math, biology, chemistry, physics, or special education. You get $6,000 per year to teach in a low-performing school for four years. And you get instant access to Mardi Gras. But the idea that you have $9,000 as a supplement if you teach in these high-need areas and you teach in a low-performing school is going to entice someone to go to Louisiana and teach. Um, we have other types of programs that are available in other states. Maryland offers a tuition reimbursement for teacher training in a specified shorted subject area. That's going to be math, science, special education. Um, there are nine states that offer loan forgiveness for teachers in high-need schools. There are 12 states that offer loan forgiveness for teachers in high-need areas, uh, math, science, and special education again. And some states go all out, uh, give uh, loan forgiveness, mortgage assistance, and tuition reimbursements, and scholarships. So there are other things that states are doing to entice the teachers that we need. Because math, science, and special education teachers are in such high demand, they can basically have their choice of what state they want to go to, and these other states are offering them incentives, there I use the I word, uh, that will entice them to go to their state. A few recommendations on what we can do. High quality induction programs obviously is something that was uh, discussed in that last slide. I, one thing to, to note is that there are 32 states that have some sort of teacher mentoring program, but only 14 of those actually pay the mentors according to the National Council of Teacher Quality. So it's not necessarily something that you need to do to attach some sort of financial bonus to a teacher who's a mentor. There might be other ways to help that teacher out, perhaps giving them an extra period to uh, meet with their mentee. Performance pay, I'm sure we'll, we'll have a significant discussion of that, but uh, the purpose of performance pay, and this is something that's confusing to a lot of people, but uh, Dr. Stallings was right. You, you don't award performance pay and the teacher will somehow perform twice as bad, twice as good, or they'll somehow become a mega teacher uh, and, and just dominate. This is for retention purposes. That's why you give performance pay. You give performance pay to keep that teacher in the classroom, not in somehow hoping that they're going to perform even better. Differential pay for hard to staff schools and high demand credentials. Obviously, uh, we had some discussion of that. Uh, you know, this is the sort of approach that a lot of other states are taking. Uh, Defining how much you want to spend on that differential pay is something we can have a discussion about, but finding some sort of compensation to draw those high quality teachers to those difficult schools seems to make sense. Pay scale flexibility. Uh, let's see some experimentation with pay scales. Uh, not only that, here's one thing that we really need to do is look at charter schools that aren't required to use the state salary schedule. What charter schools have innovative practices in the way they pay teachers that we can implement in our schools? Now, I don't have the answer to that, unfortunately. Uh, but we should get that answer. Because I'll bet you that there are charter schools out there that have innovative pay programs that may include some sort of differential pay, that may include some sort of pay for performance, that help keep teachers in the classroom. Leadership opportunities. Now, one thing that 
I have a difference of opinion in is uh, I don't want to take that great teacher out of the classroom and allow them to roam around and help people. The leadership opportunities that I have in mind are teachers that are department chairs or lead professional learning communities, small teams of teachers in different subjects. Uh, they should get paid for that. They should be leaders of those types of groups. The last thing we want to do is to take a great teacher and allow them to get out of the classroom and not have the effect on those students that they should have. I think that would really be a disservice to teachers or to the students uh, to take that teacher out of the classroom. Contractual flexibility, I threw this one in thinking about uh, athletes. You know, we reward athletes with special contracts, with special provisions and privileges. And it seems to me that there might be some way that we can do that for our very best teachers. Now, I'm not quite sure what that looks like. Uh, and it's, it's perhaps a discussion that we should have. Uh, but certainly, there's a way that we can tailor make a contract uh, for a teacher that allows them to feel the security of being in that position, to have perhaps extra days off, or some sort of flexibility in that sense. And professional development. And I will not take credit for this idea. It was given to me by a teacher from Asheville named Brian Randall, who is a Hope Street Group fellow. And he's working on an idea to try to get teachers to be the ones that are the primarily, primary uh, <coughs> providers of professional development. In other words, we pay the teachers to provide the professional development, not some outside group or not some uh, consultant or university professor. Uh, he says through the research of the Hope Street Group that teachers uh, overwhelmingly prefer professional development that's led by other teachers. Uh, so if we can leverage some of the funds that we have for professional development now, and allow teachers to be the primary providers of professional development, we have a, a mechanism in place to increase their salary, give them some sort of other uh, helpful activity to do that would be beneficial to other teachers and the students. And I'll be happy to put you in touch with Brian if you would like. So why am I not recommending an across-the-board salary increase? Well, this is what economists call the bad equilibrium. When you raise salaries across the board, both your best teachers and your worst teachers receive that salary. You are incentivizing the bad teachers to stay in the profession because they're assuming that the across-the-board pay increase is what they will keep receiving regardless of how they are performing. So this creates a situation where we are essentially allowing those poor teachers to stay in the profession and not really rewarding our most effective teachers. And, and that's what uh, having some sort of differentiated pay, some sort of performance pay will do is to allow our very best teachers to receive the compensation they deserve and to more than anything keep them in the classroom. Retention is the absolute key, it's the absolute purpose of having any sort of differentiated pay. And by the way, this, this, this set across the board salary increases are one of the reasons why we don't see a strong relationship between teacher compensation and student performance. Because we have, along the way, rewarded our worst along with our best. So we're not seeing, the research isn't really showing that the level of compensation that we give to teachers has some sort of uh, so, uh, substantial effect on student performance. North Carolina is not alone in this. I mean, no, most states have a situation where they give across the board pay increases or have some uniform salary schedule. Uh, it's a problem that a lot of states are dealing with. And we could really be a leader if we started moving away from these, these sort of ideas. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, keep pounding. <laughs>